you can see. Uh, okay. So this is about the uh, hundred Islamic sites and online. Uh, uh, NU online is on the top and uh, Halafi on the fourth uh, and then also on the fifth. Okay. <coughs> The result of uh, digital activism among traditionalists is the rise of media savior, social media celebrities among Salafis, uh, among traditionalists. We can see that many popular, uh, many traditional, popular preachers, popular academicians, public intellectuals with NO background or Pesantren background, now they are online. We can also find social media celebrities named Anwar Zahid and Gus These two persons are very interesting because actually both are not using uh, their own website or any other um, online platforms but thanks uh, to the efforts of their lovers their muhibbin these two persons become very famous Anwar Zahid's video uh, sermon videos viewed by more than three million viewers, I think uh, now already five millions or four, four or five. So. And also Kusbaha, Kusbaha is, yeah, this is of Kiyai, yeah? Kiyai the, the leader of Pesantren. Uh, he also uh, does not have uh, any uh, online platforms, does not use uh, social media, but he is very, uh, he's very famous. <coughs> okay. We can also uh, see that that many ulama traditionalists called Kiai, uh, in addition to uh, Anwar Zaid and Kusba, also the old Kiai like Kusbos, Buya Yahya, Kiai Marzuki, Buya Sakur, and others. They have uh, they established their their. Uh, online canals. In terms of genders, now the online presence of traditional female ulama, or uh, called punyai, and female preachers, uh, can be accessed worldwide. Uh, Isma, uh, I think uh, one of the participants in this conference will, tas, uh, will tell us more about this, uh, this female ulama. And the last is the rise of Aswaja YouTuber. Aswaja is Ahlu Sunnah Wal Jamaah. Actually, this, uh, this term also used by uh, Salafi uh, in, the early, uh, in their early development, uh, the early development of the movement uh, with the establishment of uh, forum Communication, communication forums for Ahlu Sunnah Wal Jamaah, which then uh, established Laskar Jihad, uh, the Salafi para, para military, uh, already studied uh, very extensively, very deeply by Professor Nur Haiti. But Aswaja, now Aswaja uh, is re. Uh, taken by traditionalists. Uh, they tried uh, to use Aswaja as a tool or as a counter to Salavi. Uh, yeah. 
So uh, I have some pictures here. On the top is uh, uh, this, these two, uh, these two creatures of, uh, you know, like uh, new creatures in in uh, in the Pesantren tradition. On the top is Kusmuafek, uh, and on the bottom is Kusmifta, uh, both graduate from this university, actually. But now they become very famous as uh, preachers, popular preachers. And you know, next to Gus uh, Muafek is the president of Indonesia, Mr. Jokowi, Jokowi Dodo. And next to the uh, to Mifta is popular uh, celebrity in Jakarta, uh, Didi Kobusil. He's very famous for his uh, talk show uh, and also podcast. <coughs> Next, this is Cosmos, the old Kiai. Yeah. Although he is uh, now already more than 60 years old, I think. Yeah, I, I, almost 80. Yeah, almost 80. He used media, social media very extensively. You can also, uh, uh, his uh, Facebook fan page, where he always uh, post uh, Friday call. Uh, yeah, Jum'ah uh, prayer, Jum'ah uh, call. Uh, yeah, Jum'ah call, I, I think. And the next, ah, this is Gus uh, Baha and Kiai uh, Anwar Zaid, both uh, celebrity, celebrities. My student wrote an article about him, about uh, Anwar Zaid. He is a key YouTube Kiai. Uh, she, she called Anwar Zaid as a YouTube Kiai, because uh, thanks to uh, his online, uh, uh, this uh, present on YouTube, although he does not have any official uh, YouTube channel. Okay. Next. Now I'm uh, going to discuss uh, Aswaja YouTuber as case study. Uh, I have uh, interviewed four of them, uh, of course by phone. It's not possible for me to uh, meet them in person. But from the, uh, the interview, uh, by phone interview, I have some, some things to uh, present here. They are uh, consisting of young pesantren graduates. Some of them are, uh, uh, some of them attended university. <coughs> Most of them called Gus. So uh, among these YouTubers, called their fellow YouTubers as Gus. Gus is the son of Kiai, Kustur, uh, the fourth president, uh, uh, Abdul Rahman Wahid also uh, called uh, famously for his uh, appellation as Kus, Kus, uh, Kustur. But thanks to the media, the social media, Kus now is uh, not only used by the sons of uh, Kiai. So, uh, it gains a uh, uh, new sense of Gus. It's like, uh, yeah, like celebrity of the sons uh, of YouTuber, uh, celebrity aspects of uh, YouTuber's performance on the online uh, arena. In general, the aims uh, to, uh, to spread Islamic 
knowledge in Tasharul Alam, to use uh, the words of uh, one of two YouTubers. However, most significantly, they want to defend and protect Membentengi the doctrine of Afwaj Aswaja Ahlu Sunnah Wal Jamaah against the Salafi Wahhabi attacks. For them, Kiai do not have to directly handle the criticism to counter criticism Salafi Wahhabi uh, domination because they can manage to do it. So they can attack. Salafis. Interestingly, although identifying themselves with the new uh, NU tradition, they used the term Aswaja in a wider scope, including those who follow the teachings of Madahib. And consequently, preacher outside the Nahdlatul Ulama can be considered as Aswaja preacher. <coughs> Their criticism is mostly deeply rooted in the tradition of Kitab Kuning reading. So they use uh, Kitab Kuning as like uh, as dalil, uh, proof text for attacking the domi the textual domination, uh, which is uh, you know owned or, or uh, dominated by Salafis. Salafis, uh, you know, as, as a scriptural uh, scripturalist group, they tend to consider that Quran and Sunnah, the text, the core text of Islam as uh, superiori superior, superiority, as superior to other sources of Islam. For them, kita kuning, yeah, becomes dalil that validate their interpretation of Islam. The online availability of kitab kuning, so uh, now we can uh, access kitab kuning online, and other uh, digital sources such as Maktaba Samila help them to correct and cross check or the accuracy of Salafi uh, Salafi teacher in referencing their uh, sermons. When Salafi preachers referencing to uh, certain kitab, classical kitab, then Aswaja uh, YouTubers checks the accuracy, uh, the trustfulness of uh, the way Salafi <coughs> refer to. Next. So this is one of the uh, one of YouTubers that I already uh, interviewed. This is Zaka, and she, and she, uh, his name is Zaini, Zainal Karim. This person is f very interesting because he studied in uh, he is a member of pesantren in uh, in Madura uh, Al Amin friend one uh, Pak Martin no I think knows a uh, uh, lot and he also taught in Safi uh, pesantren in Jakarta for a couple of years and also attended uh, at, uh, went to the University of Azahra in Jakarta, and then uh, he moved back to Al Amin Pesantren in Madura. And now, uh, while teaching in the Pesantren, he also becoming a very productive YouTuber. So uh, you can see here that many Salafis. Uh, like, yeah, this one is uh, sorry, sorry. This is Salafi. Yeah, this is about Salafi. Ustad Wahabi and Fitah. So, uh, oh yeah, I forgot to mention that uh, they tend to, to use uh, Wahabi uh, more than Salafi actually, because what. Salafi pesantren traditional pesantren are Salafis. Before the coming of uh, of Salafi, they are already Salafi. So pesantren students call themselves as student of Salafi pesantren. 
But with the coming of Salafis, the term Salafism the stuff, uh, is taken over, especially uh, in the media. So because of that, uh, YouTubers, uh, Aswaja YouTubers, prefer using Wahhabi to Salafi. And this is, uh, this, uh, this Wahhabi terms has its historical roots uh, back to the, the times before the establishment of Nahdlatul Ama. Pesantren uh, Kiai gathered to discuss the the term, uh, you know, the the Salafi domination uh, in in Mecca and Medina in the uh, in the you know, early or later part of twenties uh, twenties uh, uh, no no eighteenth uh, century, you know, and there is a moment called. Uh, committee Hijaz. Committee Hijaz is a, a committee established to respond the rise of Saud uh, family uh, and the establishing uh, the establishment of uh, Saudi uh, kingdom. And because the Saudi family embraced Wahhabism which is in contrast, which is opposed to the traditional interpretation of Islam. So uh, several Kiais gathered and formed a committee hijaz in response to that thing, because they fear that, that, that uh, traditional uh, trad Islamic tradition, which, uh, which are already uh, rooted in Indonesia will disappear because of, uh, uh, of th that event. So uh, they use the combination of Salafi, Wahhabi, Wahhabi Salafi. And the next, next is, uh, this is also, also uh, Im important. Uh, he is a Santri for more than 10 years the students of uh, Pesantren in Probolinggo, one of the important Pesantren in Probolinggo is Java. Actually, this uh, Probolinggo, for me, I, I don't know uh, if one of you uh, uh, comes from Probolinggo. For my standard, uh, uh, who lived in Jogja for yeah, uh, more than 10 years, uh, I feel that Propolungo is very remote to the center of uh, uh, to the city center to the to the center of discourse the Islamic discourse. But uh, thanks to his online activities, and he was use use uh, online information very extensively. He uh, can respond very fluently to the domination of uh, Salafism. This is uh, only two examples of, uh, <coughs> I think, more than tens of uh, example, tens exam tens examples. Next. What, what is the problem with Salafi? That's a question. What is the problem uh, for me? What is the problem with uh, for, for them? What is the problem, uh, Salafi? Uh, they said that Salafi religious views are not a big problem for them. No, not at all. Since it is a matter of uh, disagreement of ikhtilaf, and ikhtilaf for Santri is uh, yeah normal, not so special because they are already trained in religious debates. Yeah, ikhtilaf. The problem with Salafi for them is the intolerance of Salafis toward the differences of opinion. 
as long as they do not, uh, as long as Salafis do not blame Islamic traditions, practices of other groups, Salafis for them are not a big problem. Uh, next, I come to the last point that I want to raise here. It is a debate of, uh, on nationalism among Salafis, uh, between Salafis and Aswaja YouTubers. It, uh, this is uh, a topic that, uh, that is important to see how uh, Salafis, traditionalists, also uh, uh, Ikhwani uh, activists going uh, online and debate religious matters and other uh, and also political matters. <clears throat> we start from Hubbul Watan Minal Iman. This is the uh, uh, the, the jargon uh, that is very popular among NU and also Pesantren uh, members. Some say that it is the word of ulama, but some other considered uh, the jargon as a hadith. Many others, including including Salafis, this is the fabricated hadith or hadith maudu. Salafi Salafi based uh, Salafis based their opinion on Hubul Watan on the information uh, the on Albani. One Salafi popular, popular preacher, Khalid Basalamah, considered that nationalism can only applic be applicable uh, and can, can only be applied to Islamic lands or wilayah, Islami, wilayah Islam. Another Salafi preacher, Sofyan Ruray, said that loving the land hubbul uh, hubbul minal iman is not recommended by islam but loving mecca and madinah is in response to this opinion zaka the one that i have uh, shown to you said that, uh, uh, based his opinion on imam suyuti hadith and the quran and he conclude that this uh, the, the the opinion of the, the Salafi opinion on Hubbul Watan Iman and and his response to that his critic is not only uh, uh, that that Salafi opinion or uh, yeah is not only a form of uh, religious radicalism but the seed uh, but also a seed or root of terrorism. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for this very uh, enlightening and uh, interesting uh, 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 lecture. I really learned a lot and uh, remain with a lot of questions, but well, I will not start questioning. I suppose there are a lot of questions in the audience and I would like to invite everybody to uh, start raising their hands, etc. I see already a lot. <laughs> One, two, three. Um, could somebody bring the microphone to, um, well, maybe it's good to start from the, the first person here and then, oh, well, at the start here. Yes, and I take these three questions and then we go uh, to another round. Please. Very much. Um, from uh, that is very interesting uh, presentation. Yeah? You talk about a hot topic today where uh, many Muslims now go online to, to do their activities. Yeah? Uh, Topic about mobility and mobilization of Muslims in online space uh, has been published in some paper and also presented in some seminar. Yeah? But uh, what I see that Muslim people uh, think a bit negative about uh, about Muslims are uh, moving in online space now. Yeah? 
Uh, actually, if we, if we see uh, another field of science mm -hmm. like in business, they take more advantage of this uh, phenomena. Yeah? However, uh, mostly uh, Islamic uh, education institution, they, are, they, they do not take more action uh, to respond to this phenomena. Uh, look, for example, uh, the curriculum in uh, Pesantren or Madrasa or uh, higher education in universities, they are not changing yet. Uh, if, I mean, uh, my question is, uh, do you have any uh, opinion or what do you think uh, Islamic education institutions should do in response to this uh, phenomena? I mean in a positive way, rather than we talk about uh, uh, a bit negative like uh, terrorism or, or radicalism on, on, on online space. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. thank you very much. I will take the second question. Can, can you pass the microphone to... Uh, ah, there is another one. So I have two questions. And first, I would like to thank you for the presentation. It was very interesting. Um, and we've heard about this kind of uh, topic also yesterday a little bit in the, um, the panels. And um, I believe also by your student, actually. So um, first of all, yeah, thank you for that. But um, so I have two questions. And I think they're kind of interrelated. Um, I would like to know, um, first of all, how you selected the different uh, YouTube, YouTube channels that you're looking at. The, I wanted to know how you selected the different YouTube channels that you're looking at. Um, are you looking at virality, like how viral they're going, or how much they're shared, or the subscriber count? Um, and the reason I'm asking this is my second question is, um, who is the audience of these uh, videos? Um, so, as far as I understood from your presentation, there are kind of as an, an answer, an opposition to, I'm, I'm talking about Aswaja YouTube uh, video specifically, um, they're kind of meant as an opposition to the Salafi um, videos. And um, yeah, I just wanted to know um, the audience because it is dependent, they're still dependent on, you know, people actually watching these videos, people you know, liking them and subscribing to the channel. So just them being in opposition to the, the other videos is not enough, as far as I know. They still need people to interact with them. So who is their audience? Are they, um, what kind of generational gap are they looking at? Are they looking for younger people or older people? Are they looking for the uh, diasporic communities? Or are they really focusing on Indonesia? And if they're focusing only on Indonesia, um, who are the specific groups within that? Are they looking at people that are already in these communities? Or are they looking towards getting people like interested in their subject matter? Thank you. Last question. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Sunarwato from for your interesting and illustrative presentation. I've enjoyed it very much. Uh, I have uh, two brief questions. The first one is, uh, in the beginning of your presentation, you mentioned about the importance of uh, political factors in kind of uh, enabling and facilitating the rise or the emergence of uh, traditional or NU-based uh, digital activism among their members and uh, followers. And you... Uh, a mention about uh, Islam Nusantara, the, the introduction of Islam Nusantara in 2015, and also Hari Santri, uh, Santri Day, and also in 2015. Uh, I uh, allow me to borrow uh, Pak Martin uh, abstract, which quoted uh, Islam Nusantara as state ideology. I, I am wondering uh, how you can uh, connect or elaborate further about these uh, at least two uh, political moments uh, to enable or to facilitate the rise or the emergence of uh, digital activism among uh, traditional members. Are they uh, very connected? Do they have uh, uh, 
social and political inf infrastructure, which uh, the activist, uh, social media or technology savvy activists use for promoting and advancing their ideas or their platforms. I'm I'm really interested to uh, to listen more about uh, this uh, explanation. And second one is uh, perhaps uh, it's very connected to the previous question about the audience. Uh, you show uh, the list of uh, Islamic website, right? Which uh, put the uh, NU online in the first in the top of the list. But if you look at uh, YouTube, a popular preacher YouTube, for example, you can you will see very different and totally different, perhaps totally different figure. Uh, among the top is. Uh, was Ustad Abdul Somad, uh, Hanan Ataki, uh, perhaps Agim. Could still. you please ask your yeah, question? Yeah, and the, the, my question is: uh, Are these uh, two different platforms serving uh, two different uh, audience? The text, the Islamic website, uh, uh, serve uh, more educated and literate uh, Santris or Muslims, and uh, YouTube is far more popular. And how is your? Uh, take on this subject, the difference between popular preacher on YouTube and Islamic website. Thank you. Thank you very much for the for very difficult <laughs> questions. <laughs> uh, but it's very interesting. <coughs> uh, positive uh, reaction from you mean positive reaction from the Pesantren or standard education all educations okay, okay. Uh, but I want to start with uh, uh, with the sun trends uh, based on my personal observation uh, I visited many times traditional traditional sun trends in uh, especially in Kadiri uh, when we go to the you know bookstores or canteen uh, of the Pasan trends, we can see that there is a very interesting phenomena that media are now uh, very important for Santris. Yeah? They use media, modern media. Uh, and also used not kitab kuning but also white kitab kun uh, white kitab uh, kitab putih. Uh, this is very important uh, development of uh, pesantren. I think uh, they are, they are not only use kitab kuning but also the new sources of of uh, Islamic knowledge. Uh, back to the media, uh, many santri now. Use media, although uh, pesantren always uh, ha have their own restriction to the use of media, especially uh, when uh, in the beginning of the COVID uh, pandemic, we saw that most santri are allowed to use uh, you know mobile phones, including my son. <laughs> so. Uh, with this uh, use of new me uh, social media uh, mobile phone, they know the information, the debate. It is true that uh, the curriculums of a sentence are not you know, changing much, but the way they they consume Islamic information now is not restricted to Kitab Kuning. That is positive uh, development. And also how they react to the discourse, Islamic discourse outside uh, Pesantrens. Okay. Uh, I don't know whether this answer will, yeah, maybe we talk later. <laughs> Uh, to the to the next question, the, how I select my data? This is very hard because, uh, uh, yeah, with uh, being familiar with YouTube and uh, other 
forms of uh, social media. Actually, I myself uh, can uh, identify which groups yeah, I'm looking for. Uh, I can identify which which group, uh, whose whose channel, whose platforms uh, uh, I am watching. I'm viewing. <coughs> This familiarity with with uh, with uh, uh, with the platforms for myself, and who are the audience? And this is also uh, the question by the third uh, the third uh, penanya askers about the the audience. The audience mostly uh, what can uh, what I can identify is that because. Uh, YouTube, uh, Aswaja YouTube, uh, also uh, many, many of their videos shared uh, on other or other platforms like uh, Instagram, uh, and we we, can, we we know that uh, many. Pesantren komun, uh, commoners, awam pesantren, used loud uh, those videos in order to uh, uh, to be able to recount uh, uh, counter the the Salafi the the this, uh, let's say Salafi videos. So when uh, they want to react. To Salafi, uh, Salafi videos, they use uh, uh, one of the sources uh, uh, is uh, are those Aswaja YouTubers. We can see that. Uh, so, the, uh, but also Santris, uh, uh, Santri graduates, of course, uh, and all commerce uh, and all awam also use. Uh, those sources, those, those online sources from from uh, Aswaja YouTube. But of course, uh, in order to make sure that I'm right, I'm going to. Mm, but what I'm uh, what I haven't done is uh, to really interview one or uh, some of uh, the audience of YouTube. But I will do that. <coughs> uh, how, and then, how politics are uh, is is related? How Islam Nusantara uh, or, or politics is related to the the activities of uh, YouTubers or or other uh, social media activities? Uh, uh, for me, it is very very tricky to uh, to see how uh, I can. Uh, be sure that that uh, it is enough data to say the, to state that that Islam Nusantara or uh, other discourse, uh, other discussions, uh, uh, other topics are related to the state, because most uh, most I think more than half of uh, YouTubers video, YouTubers video uh, videos. Are uh, uh, related to uh, to Islamic law or to fiqh, yeah. But when it comes to the discussions of how we uh, how to deal with other groups. I sure I'm I'm uh, I can be very sure that I can claim that their YouTube activists are also useful to see how actually Santris or, uh, or Aswaja YouTube respond to uh, to the political uh, to the political matters. Uh, that are going on. So 
In other words, I want to say that they also express their opinion on political matters. They also relate to uh, relate their their discussion to uh, to res to, res uh, to respond the the politics. And then, yeah, you know, that's my. Yeah. Okay. Um, there is now one question online that will be read by Rafik. Please, can you give Rafik uh, some sound? Rafik. Thank you. That's actually two questions, Petra. So. Uh, one from Mashkur Razi Suradiningrat. Uh, during pandemic era, we realized that many traditionalists moved to digital place to preach. But most interesting is that of traditionalist Santri who graduated from Pesantren. When I was a teacher in Pesantren, many times I saw my former students slowly influenced by Salavism, especially from media. My question is, what is your opinion about that, especially the rules of traditionalist ulama to maintain the Pesantren religious orientation f of their alumni. And the second question from Nur Isma. Thank you for the presentation, Dr. Sunarwoto. I have a question about the funding support. Where do they get the support? Thank you. <laughs> for the Salafism, actually. Thank you. OK. Uh, how uh, uh, traditionalists move to digital platforms and uh, how they respond to Salafi? Is that right? Okay. Uh, well, uh, it is interesting that actually, as, as I said, there is no problem with with with, with Salafi uh, in terms of their uh, religious opinions, as long as they uh, do not bother, do not uh, make trouble with traditionalist uh, cultures and traditions. <coughs> but uh, the f I think I think I, I want to say that the function of uh, of using as much uh, YouTube's video I think is to defend or to, to uh, what is it uh, to make them uh, to make them. Uh, uh, what is percaya diri? Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they make them confidence uh, to uh, to attack uh, to attack Salafi without uh, you know referring to the Kitab Kuning. That is what uh, what happens uh, in the field, I think, uh, because as I says. Uh, YouTubers also said that uh, actually, even though they try hard to attack Salafis, they convince they are convinced that Salafi Salafis will never change. They will always stick to their own position. But YouTubers said that that it is important for them to protect their fellow traditionalists, their fellow Santris, their fellow uh, NU members from being influenced by Salafis. And what's the funding? Do you mean uh, where Salafi get the fund? OK. Uh, there is a new development among Salafis that is different from the early movement. When uh, in the first, uh, in the beginning of Salafi movement in Indonesia, they got a lot of uh, funding from uh, Arabs, Arab countries like Kuwait and also Saudi Arabia. But when 
they are now uh, can be settled and uh, they can save their uh, economic situation, uh, the, the economic stability, uh, stability among pesantrens uh, through their economic activities, like, uh, you know, uh, establishing mini markets, uh, selling herbal herbals yeah, and medicines, and also uh, now most Salafi, the big Salafi, are uh, already uh, independent, uh, uh, economically independent, uh, or relatively independent uh, compared to the the early situation, the early their early mo movement. Now they uh, they can also uh, attract the fin financial support through donation. Uh, based on my research, uh, two or uh, I think three years ago, when I visited the uh, pesantren in Solo, uh, they published uh, an information about they call for donation. Uh, only one month they can get very huge number of uh, money from uh, from the society from society from uh, Muslim communities running uh, that pesantren. This is explained why now they are uh, relatively independent from Arabic countries. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think there is room for one last question. Who wants to ask the last question? And please ask your questions short. You want to ask the question? Okay, you're most welcome. But keep your questions short, please. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Sunarwoto, for your kind presentation. I have two question actually. First is related to conceptual term that you used uh, in this presentation. Uh, I get from your presentation that you identified NU and Pesantren as a traditionalist um, because they are referring to mazhab for interpreting the Islamic text. But in the fact, uh, there are also NU and traditionalist scholars who are uh, trying to read critically the tradition and Islamic text. Uh, we can say it they are modernists. So, what actually your theoretical definition about traditionalist and what distinguish it from modernist? This is the first question. So the second question is uh, about NU YouTubers. According to your presentation that traditionalists uh, are political since the development of Islam Nusantara and Sahari Santri. So is there any YouTubers or maybe a single channel that talk, engage, and involve in political issue? They are talking to like Dua Satu Dua movement that we have listened yesterday. Maybe that, thank you. Thank you for the questions. Uh, and who is traditionalist? And the term traditionalist. <coughs> As I said in my presentation, I refer to uh, to Hamde, uh, uh, who wrote a book uh, on Salafism and traditionalism, and he said that traditionalism uh, in his book refers to the, those uh, follow the madhab, uh, well, uh, Salafis or, or um, revivalists, or yeah, uh, not. Uh, do not use madhab as a soul uh, or, or uh, you know the highest uh, reference for Islam. It's simple, simple, very, very simple uh, definition, but it's useful for me when I uh, follow you. <laughs> let's say to use uh, uh, to say that N O members are modernists 
I don't have any, uh, you know, uh, basis <laughs> to, to state that, that it's about uh, uh, the useful uh, uh, the usual term to analyze is uh, <coughs> it's it's not a yeah you can agree with me or <laughs> disagree okay but, uh, the next is about what is it about more political uh, political oh. Yeah, uh, some as well as just YouTubers uh, involved in the 212 movement, but I think I'm not uh, concerned with that uh, with their involvement. What is important for me is the question: Why? Uh, how, how to connect their online activities to the? Political discourse. Otherwise, uh, we can only see that they debate uh, with Salafi uh, concerning Islamic law, Islamic ethics. There is there is no relation to 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 politics. But I think it's it's it, it's useful to uh, connect their activities to political discourse, you know, how they react to the politics, yeah, to democracy, to uh, intolerance, and so on and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Sunabato. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, the audience. Before we go for uh, a coffee for more or less 15 minutes, Sarah has to make some announcements. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I have three things to mention for you. First of all, um, you can always check the updated booklet uh, program if you use the QR code, which is on the back of uh, the booklet or it's on the posters, and you can also use the link. It's being updated on a daily basis. Uh, then I have a a pile of badges here, so if you haven't collected your badge yet, please do so. And uh, lastly, there is a list for people to attend the excursion. Uh, it's for the participants of the summer school. You can either attend on Thursday. Uh, the meetup people have to attend on Saturday. If you want to join, please write your name on the list. Um, we leave at 8 o'clock in the morning, and the costs are $80 per person. Okay, thank you. Yeah, everyone, we have uh, 15 minutes for break, and there is uh, refreshment outside this room, and we will s continue our. Um, key, is that the the next session will be held on 10:45. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Karena namanya refreshment, so really harus refresh. Yeah. So because we call it refreshment, refreshment. After that, you have to refresh. <laughs>
be active in this respect. Today she will talk to us. I'm just looking there because I don't see her, but she might be. I'm, I'm certainly she hears me. Um, so uh, she will now talk to us on the uh, uh, on the topic on the move: religious knowledge and Muslim women's uh, virtual mobility. And I'm really looking forward to hearing it. Yes, thank you very much. Good morning to everybody from Germany. Slamat Pagi. I hope everybody can I was hear me. Like one of these TV presenters when nothing happens. But there she is. Can you hear me? Good morning, Claudia. Yeah, you can hear me. Yes, clear, Claudia. Okay, so then, <laughs> thank you once again. Um, good morning, everybody from from Germany, uh, Slama Pagi. Thanks, uh, my dear colleague Albrecht, and of course, thanks to um, the organizers, to pa Nur Heidi and the team over there, um, but also to the technical support. I think they are in contact. Can you hear me, Claudia? Yeah, uh, you can hear me. We cannot hear you in the moment. I think this will be solved in a second. We are working on it, and then we can retry because I'm not so good in lip uh, uh, reading. Uh, uh, but I think it's just a matter of time. Does it work now? Could you try, maybe, Claudia? Yes, yes, we can hear you now. Okay. Very well. Yes, I think so. Yes. yes. I was assured so. <laughs> okay. So then, please, Claudia, as I said, we're really forward to hearing your talk, please. Okay, yes.
Schluss was um, sharing with us yesterday in our process we are being very much um, focusing and concentrating on um, Muslim women who are mobile across Asia or sometimes also across the world and who are uh, very professional um, using uh, religious knowledge but um, not in the way as we've uh, seen yesterday and um, as um, also was mentioned by other close um, on the Norisma's team work um, uh, professionals in um, let's say uh, in the realm of um, digital software etc. We are particularly looking at women who are more into what we um, might call uh, the big inverted commas um, secular uh, professions. Um, and we see here uh, three examples of um, women we have been talking to and we put during the pandemic. The only means to, to get in, in touch and to communicate was actually via the digital media. Um, then we have in Abbas and Am Amla, they are uh, graduates in their mid-thirties. Um, they uh, mm -hmm. have gone through professional training. And they have resumed their academic engagement via online e communities or via what we typically call startups. Um, they have joined online classes for studying Islam or became teachers themselves. Um, and they use the resulting networks of um, their studies and their knowledge repertoires. To, in a way, rebrand their professional training and expertise and then also to become role models in what we would call um, work-life balance, we might say. So we are looking at women who are mobile uh, geographically, but um, not physically, digitally. Um, we look at engagement across different fields. And um, we are looking at, at women who are also eager to fulfill all the needs of their education and moral dedication. So, let us start with um, Radeha. Uh, she went from volunteering to professional counseling um, into a parenting. Radeha moved from home to reduce stress on the COVID-driven, overburdened government hospital in Pakistan. And while she lives in Riyadh with her and her husband in Saudi Arabia, um, her husband works there, uh, this has not changed her routine of saving the community back home, meaning saving our Certainly not saving, excuse me, serving the community back home, serving the community in, in Pakistan. Initially, Madira wanted to become a religious scholar, but her mother recommended her to, to join a medical school, um, so that she is um, a medical expert um, nowadays. And most of the medical advice she provides is indeed via telemedicine routes on health or mental health problems, uh, and very often it is also free of cost, so earning money is definitely a secondary goal on this path. Mm. She creates online content that is accessible for women with lesser knowledge about health issues, and, and this is what is important now when we think of religious knowledge and Islamic knowledge, um, she makes sure that health and spiritual requirements are in accordance with each other. So she makes sure um, that she's into uh, something that we might call halal medicine or um, yeah, maybe also the therapy. So here is a, a quote from the interview. Um, a female doctor, she says, helps other women take care of their purga. And they do not need to expose themselves in front of the male doctor. Mm -hmm. 
Moreover, when a patient comes to a doctor who prescribes medicine and asks them to connect to Allah and to the Doha, they listen to their doctors. It consoles the patients when they hear the words, Allah will make everything all right. And when I was leaving from medical school, Medina says, my mother told me you will study the masterpiece of Allah, the humans. Allah himself called the human the best of the creation. And I'm not really out of the Urdu expressions now because I, do, um, I only know Arabic and even know the Urdu. Uh, when you study medicine, you will love a lot more. So this is clearly where the medical training um, and Marina's um, mission, personal mission, her mobility, her digital mobility, and her religious knowledge meet. Another one would be Uma Faraz. Mm -hmm. She went from a fiction writer and a graphic designer to become a Quranic life coach. And she finds, Uma Faraz finds in work a way of spiritual fulfillment. She is originally Indian, an Indian of Indian origin, and she settled in the United Arab Emirates. She graduated in psychology, she got married, and <clears throat> is taking off her children. But after five years, she resumed her studies by um, joining an online university um, to study Islam. And in the following five years, she completed her postgraduate my studies and wrote a dissertation about the possibility to use the Quran as a reflection tool for coaching itself. And thereafter, she started her freelance work as a Quran based life coach. Her motto is to, to provide life, create races, and supply life. And she says, as a mother, I wanted to develop a spiritual bond with my children. And not only play games and have dinner with them. I started this practice every year in the whole month of Ramadan. I sat together with my children, 10, 10 8, and 6 years old. They recited a section of the Quran and then wondered how to apply it in their lives and how it felt. That was my doodle, the second, the second one wrote copies, and my eldest child wrote his impressions. And I did it to live. And that is the way she went about using and applying Quranic verses daily life, um, making it productive for, for um, coping with difficult situations, using it to, to find comfort, to find ways of self-making, to uh, bring it into everyday life, to make use of it, and to also cater to spiritual The third one, Amna, went to become um, a psychologist to conduct psychological therapy and guidance. And Amna explains that it is um, essential to understand the techniques that are taught in mainstream psychology. But they, these mainstream techniques, mm -hmm. they must be sifted mm -hmm. to cater to a client's needs. Mainstream psychology, psychology, she says, equates religiosity with neuroticism, madness, and the loss of senses. And this, of course, is a mm -hmm. very bad um, uh, attitude. Mm -hmm. However, then she says, being a believer, um, she can relate to the patients who need help, spiritual help, and maybe need to be treated by a cognitive behavior therapy. So she feels 
found and recent science mm -hmm. has practiced the practice of cognitive behavior theory with her knowledge of the information they are in her minds. You are comfortable also in their spiritual visits. Many people need the same opinion, some guidance on how to use the prescribed medicine. They need more information about their health, health condition or simply also someone who listens to them carefully and gives them the feeling of being hurt. She wants to enable Muslim women to get services from and for women are aware of their cultural needs and of religious sensitivities. So, so um, we have here three, and this is only three, Examples of women who are very mobile, but in a virtual mobility via trans regional networks. The three case studies of Marina um, Ubakras and Anna, um, these studies show us that there might indeed be something at stake that we could call Muslim professionalism. Becoming professional as a believing Muslim woman. And that this kind of professionalism, becoming active in a professional way, is closely linked to women's mobility in the digital digital. The women's connection with online platforms, Facebook, WhatsApp groups, Instagram. Uh, this connection has helped them to um, connect with professional Muslim women in other online communities. And these more, more often than not, were the starting point and the anchors from their own. A creative appropriation of digital world enabled such as, such as Madina Omakras and Anna to, to reposition themselves and, and become, in virtually virtually, mobile, mobile in the Muslim, in the wider Muslim world. And I want to, to hint here a bit also at one question um, that was raised. Yesterday, um, isn't this also a kind of um, being immobile? Um, because we've heard uh, in some of the quotes that there are always family and, and husbands in the background or in the everyday life of the women, and we, we might also, this is open to debate, um, look at this type of virtual mobility as something that. Um, very much complies with the physical immobility because it's um, more appropriate me in a way probably not to not move outside of the house physically. Um, this is something um, also certainly open to debate. Um, so so uh, uh, the last point here, um, also getting at what was uh, we discussed yesterday, online mobility is not unlimited. Um, there are boundaries, and these boundaries are defined primarily also via linguistic ability and communication possibilities. So when um, the women we have interviewed, um, when they are uh, conducting their services, uh, it's Limited, because um, English is possible, is possible, and, and maybe in some cases it's Arabic, but uh, they wouldn't, for example, be able to um, cater to Indonesian clients. And here we clearly have uh, limits and boundaries. Um, and raising this point, since we had a question yesterday um, about the audience and who can um, yeah, who can receive. Services. Um, in this class, from the phenomenon, I did mention that um, uh, Omar Khan shaped uh, her family activity um, into a small 
working book um, and she, she published it for fellow mothers to use it for their children. Um, and this, uh, to us, is at least one example of how knowledge of and familiarity in Islam also informs new practices in this kind of applying um, the Quran to everyday life. Um, by learning how to cite the Quran as a common practice for children, um, many, many educated parents adopt new ways to integrate Islamic religion into parenting. Various material things, uh, such as um, color, color, prayer mats, comic books for moral guidance, as well as family activities like the one um, from our Christ practices. But this is something I'm very, very, very well known um, to Indonesia and to Southeast Asia. Um, so, the, so the conceptual summary here. Um, Mobilization and mobility, of course, have a long history in the social sciences and in the humanities. The term was one of the major terms in um, social sciences and humanities. Uh, but, well, it is a relational category which breaks with, um, on the one hand, methodological nationalism, but also with the notion of um, static spatial containers mm -hmm. with the notion of um, a space in the traditional sense. It emphasizes dynamics, process quality, fluidity, and um, the social production of space and productivity. And thus, um, both mobility and mobilization focus on human action and on experience and draw attention to the historical embeddedness of space and mobility. And here we um, more important our our discussion on um, um, ending with uh, an open question rather than a conclusion um, because we in our project very much look at the religious knowledge that is made for that or for becoming professionally active um, being mobile in this case here in the digital world. I would like to end with an open question and ask what is then religious knowledge and how is it made productive by the women that have been introduced? Um, how do, you, how do we want to refine the knowledge and how do we want to refine the religious? Um, I think these definitions are still very much at stake and with this um, note, with this open question, um, I would like to stop, also stop sharing the screen and to uh, thank the audience and everybody for um, the attention. Thanks a lot. Yes, uh, thank you, Claudia, for this very profound uh, 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 lecture, um, combining a methodological outline where one uh, uh, thinks again mobility. Also, we are coming here with a whole bunch of people to Indonesia. How is this a uh, 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 part of this? Um, what you would say, I don't know if it is also a, a class thing or um, uh, we would have to see. Um, or uh, uh, then in the last weeks uh, I have this uh, uh, experience of course again once the pandemic situation was uh, 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 levied that we have of course a very unequal and unjust mobility system in the world when it comes to restriction. Okay, um, but I think I really like the approach how you translated then your methodological approach into the case studies and I certainly some questions here in the audience, especially among the students and I would like to collect questions now. Other questions?
and and we have uh, uh, thankfully also uh, some time for questions. So um, maybe I mean uh, 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 I could start with one. Um, I was thinking as well uh, if you say that there is these religious uh, new arrangements on the digital uh, uh, side. I would say how how would this then in somehow. Uh, um, uh, I don't know how how is there the relationship to classic religious authority, uh, like male uh, uh, ulama authority, in combination to what you see emerging here, for example. There is, um, I'd say, no uh, antagonism, um, um, but, but uh, the, the way these women um, go about uh, in, let's say, let's say self-making, self-assertion self um, departs, of course, from the physical way also of um, um, providing services, counseling. Um, it's uh, uh, a way of, of um, complex, complex way of combining several, several approaches. Um, there is always um, something, something coming along that um, most of us would probably consider secular knowledge, like in medicine or in psychology. Uh, and this is then combined with um, uh, religious knowledge, and the question is still open with what kind of religious knowledge, uh, but it's, it's um, then made, made to translate into the services that we might provide in quite a, a different way from um, what we might know from the, um, the way classical Lama or um, Imams would uh, provide services. Um, it's it's uh, uh, a different kind of, of catering to the clients because uh, the context is um, a, a different one apart from women's worlds, men's worlds, um, and it is uh, always going along with. Um, Knowledge, knowledge, professional knowledge, that mm -hmm. has been acquired um, in, in yeah, also, yeah, also uh, uh, what we, we might call um, is it institutions. I, I, I'm avoiding to, to always have the binary of secular and religious, um, but it's a, a different um, combination of um, knowledge mm -hmm. that has been uh, acquired and um, is provided by what, yeah, what we might call the uh, classical religious scholarship. Mm -hmm. yeah, there's a question here. Yeah. And I'm still curious about what the audience says about um, uh, religious knowledge. Yes, yes. your question. Um, can we have uh, microphones here for the audience? So here there's a question for the first here and then there. For the, the in front, the mister, and then the lady in back. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Claudia, for your presentation. Uh, I'm not the, the context of the case you, you study. Uh, uh, you talk about uh, knowledge uh, combination or knowledge integration in knowledge management between religious knowledge and professional knowledge. Uh, I'm, I'm not clear, how, how did you find, or how did they do that, uh, the combination of knowledge? Is it, I think the context in, in uh, psychology, or in health, your case study? Yes. Um. Uh, let us take the, the example of um, um, Maliha, who, who gives, um, who provides medical uh, services. Um, she is, is trained in, in medicine, um, in biomedicine, 
um, when, for example, um, her clients would seek the service of any, any doctor, um, and the client was being told, mm, please take this medicine, please take these pills mm, three, um, three times a day, something like that, things we all know. Um, and the client is not quite sure what am I doing? Is, is this halal, for example? Can I take this, this medicine? Um, Maria, with her training, she would know what kind of pills, what kind of medicine is halal. Um, are there ingredients that are maybe not advisable for um, clients who really want to to stay um, with other medicine, that is one thing. And um, you cannot cure everything by giving pills and medicine. So there is also this um, spiritual dimension um, and the way of catering to clients uh, in a spiritual way, giving spiritual guidance. This combination is one example of, mm -hmm. of what, um, yeah, for example, Madiha would do. Is this um, clear? Mm -hmm. um, hello, thank you so much, Claudia, for your presentation. I have two questions. Oh, one is a question, the other is maybe a bit of a comment. Um, the first question is, how did you select these uh, case studies? And w did, they, did these people have profiles online because they've been presented as people that are, um, that are mobile in that way? Um, and the second thing is, I think one of your case studies, it was made clear, was a Pakistani woman. Um, and I'm not sure if all of them were from uh, Pakistani backgrounds, but I am Pakistani. And it made me think uh, a little bit about my experiences there with the with people that often combine uh, religious knowledge and bring it into into professional spaces. Um, so, the, well, the second comment slash question would be: Have you found there to be any contention um, between or conflict? between religious knowledge and professional practice. I think here, for example, of uh, female gynecologists in Pakistan who might often take a very conservative turn and not, for example, prescribe birth control to unmarried women um, or psychologists in Pakistan that because of certain religious convictions do not speak in the same way to queer uh, queer people. Uh, I know cases of queer kids being outed to parents, for example, uh, because the profession, the the psychologist would um, would favor a, a religious teaching over professional codes of conduct. So, what I heard from your presentation so far. Was there has been um, field work, two months field work in uh, in Indonesia by Professor Muhammadin, um, and we are yeah, yeah moving forward with um, analyzing the results of um, physical. Meetings um, with other women, uh, but um, um, the women here in the case study, um, they uh, de definitely uh, have been approached by <coughs> yeah, surfing uh, the web. Um, they are not all Pakistani um, ones of, uh, of Indian background, um, and by now, uh, yeah, you can imagine when we've been doing field work in Indonesia. Uh, we have um, quite some, some more, and uh, of course, uh, the next is um, Central Asia, um, where um, we are also, because it's French, which no one's also looking for um, cases. There is um, certainly conflict um, coming up, um, but this is at the end of the day um, something that uh, the women would have to. to by themselves um, to, to, decide to decide for themselves. Um, I would not dare to, to evaluate or to, to judge. Um, there are certain 
constraints, of course, because um, people have to comply with circumstances, with, with conditions that are given. And um, I can relate to, to what you mentioned. Uh, it is probably not recommendable to um, encourage somebody um, to, to, to live a uh, transgender uh, identity when the environment uh, doesn't approve of it, um, when there is discrimination going along with it. Uh, but there, exactly, um, I think is uh, the point where knowledge, also religious knowledge, comes into the game. The game. Um, how can this be reconciled so that um, both the individual comfort can be achieved plus um, the way of living in uh, such an environment is made possible. Um, this is uh, definitely something that individuals uh, have to uh, navigate. Um, but it's, it is at the end of the day, of course, something that uh, is um, very much connected to one's own conviction to one's own principles. First, is the microphone still with you? Oh, no. F no, then, then maybe first we're already there. A question from Frau Kranais. Hello. Um, thank you very much for your lecture. It was very interesting. I'm interested in the relationship between mobile and immobile actors or agents. And um, I'm working on that in a different context, historical context. But still, I would like to ask you, how do mobile agents, and I would consider this Indian woman who moved to Saudi Arabia with her husband as like a really mobile agent, not just virtually mobile. So do these mobile agents reflect on their relationship with those who we would consider them immobile or more immobile, and how they are looked at by those maybe they stayed at home and they are not that, yeah, not in this, they do not have the same degree of mobility or something like that, yeah. I would be interested if you could say something on that. Yes, thank you so much. Um, um, you are right, um, when we move into to the Gulf, to the United Arab Emirates or to Saudi Arabia, um, they of course have been mobile physically, um, and then they are at home, uh, becoming again mobile via digital media, but um, in a way they are also then immobile because they um, do not have to, to leave the house. Um, so there is um, mobility and uh, immobility in, uh, uh, in a uh, dialectic, if we will, um, relationship. Uh, uh, would assume um, that, of course, there is a, a lot of reflection on um, how it is it for those people who are, in this case, maybe Pakistan, who are at home, so to speak, um, who are not mobile. Um, this is uh, something that goes along with um, being able to immerse oneself into another person's situation to um, uh, to apply empathy with the situation of the one who, who seeks your advice, who seeks um, service. And um, I think this is within um, the notion of I want to be a professional in this kind of, of service. So I first have to think of those uh, who are uh, not mobile for one way or other, uh, and I have to, yeah, have to relate to, to this. Hello. Uh, hello, Claudia. It's good to see you. Uh, greetings. Christian Lange here. Um, I, I, I like to talk very much, thank you. I, I also appreciated the social scientific introduction which has really helped us to remind ourselves of 
the fact that mobility and immobility is always tied also to questions of, of uh, equality and inequality, um, which is very helpful. I, uh, my question or comment, uh, I think, relates to your final challenge, how do we understand um, religious knowledge and the transmission of religious uh, knowledge under the conditions of, let's say, post-pandemic communication um, via the internet and by digital means. Um, I want to ask you about uh, the role and the function of the human body in these interactions that, that you're describing. If there's one big theme that I, I can think of that has come out of uh, discussions in religious studies over the last 10 or 20 years or so, it, it is that religion is never a disembodied uh, experience. The body is always involved in, 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 in religious ac activity and religious communication. Um, you know, as against earlier conceptualizations of religion as a mostly intellectual or, or mental activity. Uh, and now it, it seems to me that when we talk through the internet or via Zoom to someone, there's always a loss of the body involved in, in one way or another. We lose at least three of our five senses, and the other two senses, hearing and vision, can be really badly impaired. We don't hear the other person speaking very clearly. You were very well uh, audible here, by the way. Uh, there was no problem there. We, but our, our vision is reduced, too. We only see the face, and it's much more difficult to, to interpret uh, gestures or what is going on on the other side, on the other side of the screen. Now, this is a problem, I think, a gen general problem of communicating through, through Zoom and other such means. But in the case of s spiritual counseling, the kind of uh, situations that you are describing, the problem seems multiplied uh, and much more difficult. Because I would think that spiritual instruction, transmission of, re of religious knowledge, um, requires the body to be, to be present. I recently had you know, an experience with, uh, with a Sufi sheikh uh, in the United States and we were talking about Ibn al-Arabi and discussing points and at a certain point he said yeah I cannot explain this to you you have to come here the truth that I want to to share with you can only be transmitted to you if you're here with me in, 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 in the same room so I wonder if you are if you are uh, if you are um, the people that that you study there the, the three women you, you were talking about whether they reflect on the um, difficulties of transmitting their knowledge to to others through the internet and whether they have perhaps even started to develop some kind of techniques to overcome these 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 limitations that we all face when talking to each other through through zoom thank you mm -hmm. thank you christian you, you really made a point on in the world um, recognizing understanding and um, Seeing body language is very difficult, if not possible at times, and body language uh, gestures mimic, uh, they can tell you so much, and they are so important in, in communication. Um, there is uh, certainly, when it comes to missing out on really the body language um, uh, impediment, um, given in, in this way of uh, digital counseling. Um, one of the um, advantages, I would say, um, over trying to overcome uh, this uh, clear disadvantage is that uh, at least um, the women can relate to each other uh, in uh, a shared language. And that is why language ability is so important. Um, uh, this is a sign of or a, um, a means, an instrument, a tool to uh, already um, come closer to each, to each other. Uh, the other thing, um, of course, in, um, in the digital world, which makes it very difficult, is um, that you, know, you cannot touch the person to, to, to comfort him or her, touch the shoulder or whatever. This is certainly true, but um, we had in, in our workshop, just to, to give an anecdotal evidence, we also had a woman from Afghanistan. Um, she was working as a, a yoga teacher, uh, and she was uh, quite savvy in, um, or quite uh, great in uh, setting up the so that we as the audience in 
all the parts of, of the world in Central Asia, in Europe, and in, uh, in Southeast Asia. Um, we could follow, follow her and do the exercises with her. So there is, to, to a certain degree, um, the possibility to, um, yeah, to, to read us and see uh, the body language, but I would uh, definitely agree, and I can only agree, because I am now here in Germany, and I would be feel much better off being with all of you, Dr. Um, there, there is a, a loss, um, very much so, I would agree, Christine. Okay, thank you. I, think I would like to come back to the question you were asking us. Um, maybe you could just tell us again, and then we could get some answers from the crowd. The uh, question about religious knowledge, with uh, which you actually ended your presentation, so that we can try to make an interaction. Oh, now I don't hear you. Now, now we are entering the limited zone. I'm also reminded. I think it's also classical. I'm now approaching the image, but it's not helping. Can you? Say something now, maybe. You hear me? Now I hear you, yes. Yes, I was reminded that there are online questions. I'm not sure if they Okay. If, oh, they, they, they are just coming. Someone will read out online questions. Hello. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. For your thoughtful presentation. I'm Doris Mark. Nice to meet you again. Uh, I learned a lot from uh, your presentation about the concept of mobility and mobilization. I have, I have a question about the concept. So, in, so the, in the context of training, there is a, there is a knowledge transfer from the trainer to the trainees. And this, and this transfer can uh, uh, be called as knowledge mobility because there is a, a, a how to say, we have transferred from the knowledge, the knowledge from the training and, and then the, the trainees can also transfer uh, the knowledge gain from the training to uh, other, other uh, participants in their uh, in the training in their community. So, so if I mention this can be included. You mentioned, I think, three or four dimensions in the beginning of your presentation. And that is my first question. My second question is, uh, would you like to explain the intersection between the concept of our, our work, authority, authority, and mobilization? I know uh, my, my questions are clear. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes, they are. <laughs> Thank you, Asma. Um, <laughs> it's nice to meet yeah. again, although, although not, not physically this time. Uh, first question about um, knowledge mobility. Yes, definitely. Um, you, you hit the nail. Um, the, 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 notion the notion of mobility that came along with this so-called mobility term um, meant to, to convey exactly this. Um, being mobile can happen um, in all sorts of uh, forms and ways. Uh, being mobile uh, as a human being, um, moving the body uh, is only one and maybe a, a tiny um, form of, to speak, of, of mobility. Uh, there is the mobility of, of knowledge. Knowledge is moving um, between actors. Ideas are moving, emotions are moving. Um, all sorts of, of um, yeah, what is it? Uh, cognitive elements are moving. So definitely, also when we 
we do online tracings, and of course there is um, knowledge on the move, so to speak. Um, so I would really say yes, um, that is kind of uh, uh, what we call, or what you call knowledge mobility. The second one is um, more difficult, the intersection between the concepts of power, authority and mobilization. Um, Coming from a, a social science background, uh, there are clear um, connections, uh, relationships between and mobilization. Um, those who are able, let's say we have a, um, a movement such as you have in, in Indonesia with the uh, Axi Islam, like, so, um, of course people have to when they want to mobilize others to follow them, they have to frame their idea in, in a certain way. Um, the framing is very, very important to, um, to start the, cam the campaign and to make people become followers, um, to make people believe in this, yes, this is the way to go, um, we have to achieve uh, this result, we have to, to get rid of this person in, uh, in the case of our uh, um, just by the way of example, so the, the framing uh, then gives you kind of a power to, to mobilize people and of course also um, a, a certain um, authority, an ideational authority to, to steer um, the movement in, in a certain Direction. So clearly there is uh, power relations and authority going on with mobilizing people, but there is also then, when you think of the, the end, how movements are ended, uh, of course power and authority at stake when it comes to demobilizing a movement. Um, and here I'm, I'm only now thinking of um, recent developments uh, I'm sure we all know what happens, for example, in the Belarus, um, where people were, were trying to, and I did mobilize um, to, to uh, and it didn't work because uh, the power and the authority of the dictator was um, stronger than, than the movement, and the movement was cracked down, or was crushed. Um, so this uh, is another, from the social science perspective, a uh, clear indication um, for the, the connection between power and authority and organization. Uh, uh, yes, so thank you. Our session comes to an end now. We will have uh, lunch for an hour. We thank you again. We hope to mobilize you again the next time so that we actually really have you here um, or at the place where all of us will meet you again or we have to mobilize and uh, be together again. So I thank you very much for giving this lecture at this early time in Germany and hope to see you again soon. Goodbye. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.
Ah, mana tuan? Ni amanan ni amanan.